Chubby Box. Dreamweavers by Glenn Aitken Against the faint floating shadows of an old wooden shack, an old leathery hand wiggled and wagged, weaving with a long needle as it went. A long dark patch of lightless ink trailed over the table like a black hole spilled over in the night sky and inching itself to the horizon. A glint of candlelight flickered from a speeding needle and then darted across the room, hitting the walls and sliding over darkness. The fleck of light, not much more visible than the last bit of hope floundering in a flailing flashlight, travelled over warped wooden floors and up a long crack in the stone wall. It disappeared into a thatched roof. The shadow maker exhaled deeply. The fleck came back. The pendulum of light rocked to and fro with the waving of a weaver's hand far across the room, finishing off the last knot that held the fabric together. It was the final touch, a masterstroke, and the light faded into black as he put the needle down. Aged bones creaked as the old man with the rawhide hands straightened himself out and blinked. He leaned closer to his material. A patchwork of tool and time, married by Fred, lay below him in a heap. He blotted this filled inkwell with a rag. A conglomeration of scenes, some joy, some tragedy. Figures caught in both bliss and fright, smoothed under his rough hands as he flattened out the fabric. Almost done. The weaver wound the thread, embroidering a small silver S. His signature in dreams meant for one special child above. He wound the thread one last time and tied it off. He bit down, snapping the twine. A small hair of red fibre clung to his bottom lip and wouldn't let go. It hung, gripping tight to the cracked arid skin, as if it were afraid to fall. His dry mouth <laughs> didn't spit off the cotton strand either. A quick glance at his wrinkled grimace must have changed the Fred's mind, because it finally let go and embraced the free fall, fluttering to the floor, joining the speck of light in the shadow below. A subdued blue glow crept into the barren woodhouse and blended with the candlelight. Is it ready, Sylvester? The voice came from the glow on the floor, trampling over the fallen red thread with dainty blue shod feet no more than an inch long. The sprite looked up at him with a burdened smile. She was pretty in a tired sort of way. Sylvester looked down. The pixie, Nico, aligned herself beside his workbench. Her familiar glow, a shadow sprite's signature, cast itself athwart his face. Her demure wings beat slow and steady as she rose from the floor to meet him at eye level. The gentle breeze from the lift pushed her long dark hair back and forth. She had a long face, like it had been stretched out just a little more than God intended, but was pretty regardless of a slightly off-putting disproportion. Her limbs were stretched too, and as far as shadow sprites go, it was these distorted anomalies that gave her a height advantage over her peers. By Shadow Sprite standards, she was a giant. She waited for Sylvester to speak. He's getting old. Nika thought. Much older. Working too much. She sensed it in his eyes. Too much pain. Too much loss. Ah, uh, right here. The old man shook himself back to life. The few strands of white hair that refused retreat colonized a crescent around his bald dome quivered. He picked up his work and shook it off. A few more red threads joined their brother on the ground. The sprite looked up at the scene. A castle, or rather THE castle, rose in the backdrop of Aetherland's countryside. Good, she thought. At least the castle will stand a little longer after the rest of the dreamscape has gone washing away into hell. I was getting tired of the earthquakes. Sylvester smiled admiring his work. He was one of a few master weavers left. Sure, the dreamscape was full of dream weavers, but masters? They were in short supply in the world of dreams, and they were disappearing fast. Sylvester folded the dream blanket into a square and handed it to Nika. She fluttered back up to eye level and took the fabric, folding it over and over again until it was impossibly small for how much cloth she started with. When it was the size of her hand, she moved her satchel slung across her shoulders to front and put the blanket away. It was the magic of a dreamscape at work in her delicate hands. The fabric was dream itself, taken from their world to be sent to the wakescape, the waking world above, where she would deliver the blanket to some slumbering child. She would enter as she had a thousand times before, from a shadow beneath the bed, and drape it atop his head and he would dream of that magnificent castle.
When the sleeping child did, the castle would hold out a little longer, fighting against the void. Their world would hold a little longer, and their kingdom would grow a little stronger. Lives depended on them. Hope was in her hands, shoved into her purse, and hanging beside her hips. There was already rumour of disappearing realms. Places in the minds of mankind, eaten away by lack of dreams and imagination. The void, they called it. Those were the places without weavers. Those were the places of darkness and smoke. All over the dreamscape, realms were vanishing. Something was happening up above. Something big. Humanity was losing something. And the result was felt most deeply in the collective world of dreams that lay bit beyond the periphery of consciousness. There was an emptiness devouring the collective unconsciousness of mankind. A shadow of loneliness and despair eroding its spirit. Maybe it was war. Maybe it was politics. Maybe despair. Whatever was going on up there, it sounded of children's dreams dashed and shattered against the cold hard reality, and smelled of anger, resentment, and wrath. Those children were now taking charge of their world. A generation without dreams, building upon the ashes of their fathers. All that seemed left in the world was the hope for hope, and that was fading with every setting sun. Nika's head sunk for the next generation of humanity. Their work with the dream blankets, her work in delivering them, was important. It kept them all alive. Hopefully, it would keep the world above from sinking into desolation as well. Each day the void grew. She didn't think that there were enough weavers left to keep it at bay forever. Something had to change, but the path to salvation wasn't as clear as she had hoped. Nika nodded to her weaver and headed out into the night. The air was clean and clear in the dreamscape tonight. She flew up into the air and passed the village outside the castle walls. She floated a few feet above the treetops, cool wind blasting her hair back as she struggled against the freeze. A gust blew and she fought back to correct her course. She soared towards the moon as it rose in the east. She passed grasslands and the great river that divided her kingdom from the shadowlands. She frowned as she entered those badlands filled with bad things. Nasty things grunting and rooting, wiggled and writhed across each other below. She climbed higher. There were flying things here too. Things that could end her. Far from the north, the cry of Neverflats soared on gusts. A murder of the winged abominations was in the air. She had to be quick. The sprites sped along, passing out of the Shadowlands. A large weeping willow glistened below as if it were covered in glitter. The wind brought the wailing to her, and she winced and shook off the sound. That large willow tree marked the beginning of the land of death. The weeping tree, it was called, not because it was a weeping willow, but because of the sound it made. No one dared near the silken silver boughs. The hanging canopy of starlight and sorrow emitted the sobbing of death. It wasn't the cry of those who died but a sound more cutting and cruel. It was the wail of the living. It was the noise a mother's heart makes when a child dies. It was the sound of families and lovers torn asunder. It was the sound the living made when death crept into their souls. It was the wailing lamentation of those left behind to live. Nika plugged her fingers into her ears and sped faster. The sound was too familiar, too close. Ahead of that, she saw a graveyard. She hated this place too. It was worse than the nightmares of the Shadowlands. At least that place had something in it. The graveyard was full of nothing but tombs. Nothing moved, but for the occasional kick of dust or tumble of a headstone in a strong storm. The deadscape. She whispered to herself and kept on. Miles into the graveyard, the moon rose directly over a large tomb. It loomed above the others. A temple-like structure as some edifice commemorating the passing of each soul with yawning gates and cathedral-esque spiral steeples. Chipped Corinthian pillars and the twisted grimaces of gargoyles shone white in the moonlight. It was a thing of pristine, corpse-like stillness. If there was a place souls passed through to enter hell, it must have been here. Nika went higher, satchel swinging behind her. Soft moonlight reflected from her face as she neared. The two glowing lights, the moon and the sprite, blended together, same colour and hue, until there was no discernible line to differentiate them. 
she was absorbed into the light, bathed in it, and disappeared. The light around her faded slowly. Darkness then encircled her as if she were falling through a tunnel. The light drifted away and she was left in shadow. Nika reached out her hands. Wood. Her fingers slid across what felt like worn floorboards. She pulled herself up, flipping her wings for help. She crawled out of a shadow and looked around. Toby's room. Dirty socks and dog-eared algebra books. She stepped further and looked around. She recognized it at once. His brown shaggy hair hung off the side of a bed as he snored. Nika smiled. She pulled out the dream blanket and opened it. She set to work unfolding the thing until it was the size of a medium-length man. The sprite fluttered above the sleeping adolescent and draped the fabric over him, letting it drift down and softly land over his head. It glittered and glowed and then disappeared, absorbed into his senses and skin. Nika fluttered beside him and whispered in his ear. Here you go, Toby. From your dad. Although nearly a man, he was just a child to her eyes. A lost and frightened child she watched grow. She kissed his freckled cheek and slid back into the shadow under his bed. Back into the night. Back into the dreamscape.